Okay, well, thank you very much for having me here tonight. It's a great pleasure to be able to present some of my work as part of this uh, voiceless event. As a psychologist, I'm very interested in the relationship between humans and animals. And one of the reasons that I'm really interested in this relationship is that it's conflicted, it's inconsistent, there's no rational basis for the reason that we relate to some animals in some ways and others in other sorts of ways. And this makes us very sort of fertile ground for psychological sort of theorising. And me, myself and my colleagues have looked at one particular kind of relationship that we have with animals, and that is our eating of them. That is probably the primary relationship we have with animals, our meat eating. And what we've looked at in this particular context is what we call the meat paradox. And this is basically the idea, how is it that we can eat some animals but love others? Or more generally, how is it that we can eat animals and in general care about animal welfare? So I'm going to take you through some of the studies that we've conducted in, in, uh, in my lab and other labs as well, looking at the psychology of how people resolve the meat paradox. But let me start with introducing you to man's best friend here. Friendly, loyal, intelligent, probably. And this one here, crispy, salty and good with eggs in the morning for many people. What is the difference between these two animals? Which one is more intelligent? Which one feels more pain? Which one is more morally relevant? This is a, a girl's favourite pet and also the fascination of the nation on Melbourne Cup Day. This is a staple food, good in burgers and great with fries. Why is it that we feel it's okay to eat cows but we don't feel it's okay to eat horses? And this was very evident when we came across the so-called horse meat scandal, people were outraged to find that someone had put horse meat into their food when they thought that it was cow meat. Why? People struggled to try and answer this question of why they felt so outraged. Some people talked about the fact that it was unhealthy, but of course, really, horse meat, horse meat is quite a healthy, healthy kind of meat. Other people talked about consumer confidence. You know, we, we thought we were purchasing one thing, but in fact, we were purchasing another thing. But then, I, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that if that same person went and bought a sandwich and someone had swapped the rye bread for the sourdough. Would they feel outraged about that? Or is it more the fact they'll feel outraged when the horse meat is swapped for the cow meat? Again, people had forgotten in this case that what was really driving their outrage was our relationship with animals. Horses are pets and we don't like to eat our pets. Again here, the friend, our friend of the sea with the apparent ability to smile and to entertain children, the greatest pet predator of the sea, also good with chips and tartia sauce. What is the difference between these two fish? Why do we feel it's okay to kill one and eat it and become outraged at the Japanese when they kill the other one and eat it? So this really raises the general question which I'm here to try and shed some light on tonight, which is why we love some and eat others. Why do we love some animals but find that it's okay to eat others? And I'd argue that this question cannot be answered by looking at the differences that exist between these animals that we do eat and those that do not. It, is, it cannot be answered by looking at determinable differences between these animals, but maybe it can be answered by looking at our relationship to animals. This is really what determines whether we need, eat animals or not. And of course, those relationships with animals are largely shaped by our own needs and preferences. If we have pets, we don't like to eat them, but we like the taste of bacon, so we like to eat pigs. And of course, this is also the reason that a lot of people are largely conflicted over our meat, their meat-eating choices. It's very hard to rationally justify why we choose one and not the other. The other thing that people are conflicted over is actually their consumption of food animals. We're not only conflicted over why we choose some animals to eat, we're also conflicted when we're confronted with some of the realities over the animals that we do eat. And the fact is we don't like to think about the process of the paddock to the plate. When we sit down to enjoy our steak, we don't want to think where it has come from. And this is quite evident when we look at the fact that the meat paradox is made up of really these two facts. 97% of Americans are meat eaters. In India, the least meat eating nation in the world, 65% of people eat meat. And in 2010, the US meat industry processed 9 billion land animals with sales of 155 billion, accounting for 6% of US GDP. This is big business. Eating and consuming animals and producing meat is big business. And this is probably because meat is a good source of protein, and this is why humans have sorted out for centuries, maybe not the healthiest form of protein, but certainly a very potent source of protein. But 
a vast majority of these same people also find animal suffering offensive, emotionally disturbing, and the key point is they also find it potentially disrupting to their meat-eating habits. And this is the paradox that we have when we're talking about the meat paradox. How is it that people can be concerned about animal suffering while enjoying their steak? And if you look at these pictures here, those people who do eat meat in the audience will probably find some of these relatively appetising. That is until we also join them with these pictures here and suddenly we feel a little less appetised by those pictures of meat. We suddenly think about where that meat has come from and it makes us feel a little more queasy than we did before. Of course, when we do buy meat, we like to have it packaged in, in glad wrap and white trays from the supermarket, buy some bread, buy some meat. We don't like to see the heads of the animals that we eat. We don't like to see the hoofs of the animals we eat. In some cultures they do. Generally in Western culture, we don't. And in general, we don't like to see a picture like that, which reminds us of where our meat is coming from. And of course, when we are reminded of some of the atrocities that do happen to animals in the process of meat production, we become outraged, viscerally outraged. But of course, it's much easier to point to those atrocities when they're happening in other countries, when they're happening in, in places like Indonesia, for example. But in our own backyard, these things are happening too. Factory farming is, is certainly you know, no joy for animals. But it's much easier just to brush that aside than it is, or it's much easier to point the finger when we see this happening in, in other places. So what I want to talk about is really how do people resolve this paradox, the fact that they do care about animal suffering. We all do care about animal suffering, but really a vast majority of people also eat meat. And I think that the one thing that's very critical in this whole sort of problem is that to resolve the paradox, we need to downplay the mental lives of animals. And this is because thinking, thinking of animals as thinking beings, as, as feeling beings, makes them morally relevant. We don't care about rocks because they don't think and they don't feel. We do care about puppies and babies because they do think and they, don't, and they do feel. But of course, we can change our perceptions subtly to try and suit our behaviour in some situations. And the fact is that we enjoy eating meat, but we don't like eating mines. And we've found, done some research on this, and you can see here that we've got a, a list of animals, and we ask people to rate these animals on their edibility and also on how much mine they possess. And you can see there's a fairly good negative relationship there between the animals that are seen as edible and, and how much mine they have. So we have fish and, and crabs and chickens over there and even the cow and sheep and goat, relatively less mine and definitely more edible than say your dog, your gorilla, your monkey, dolphin or horse. And you may say, well, that's all very fine and well. We've made a, a good rational choice. We've decided to only eat the animals that don't have any mines. That's a rational basis for our choice here. But I would suggest that actually it's far more motivated than that. We change our perception of animals depending on whether we eat them. And let me convince you a little bit more. We also brought some people into the lab and we, both vegetarians and meat eaters, and we, we showed them this picture of a cow and we either told them this is a cow standing in a paddock or this is a cow standing in a paddock and it's going to be killed and slaughtered for meat production. So these are two different groups. Then both groups did a mind attribution task here. So basically what they did was rated the extent to which the cow had these different mental capacities how much it could feel pleasure, fear, rage, joy, happiness, how much it could desire or wish or plan for things, how much pain, hunger it could experience, whether it could taste, see and hear, choose, think, intend, imagine and reason. So this is really how we, you know, how much mind would you attribute to this cow? What we found was that vegetarians were far more likely to attribute mind to a cow overall than meat eaters. But it, interestingly also, they weren't very sensitive to our manipulation. It didn't matter whether the cow was going to be used for meat, for a vegetarian. But for meat eaters, they subtly downplayed the mental states of a cow when they thought about it as food. Again, because perhaps they feel in some sense connected to that use of a cow. So it seems that denying mind to animals is a good way to sort of help us to eat meat. And it may be in, a untroubled, uh, in, in an untroubled kind of way. It reduces our negative feelings, our negative emotions around eating meat. We wanted to test this more directly as well. We brought people into the lab again, we, this time in groups of six to eight, and we sat them around a, a nice big round table, and we gave them some questionnaires at the beginning of the study, one of which was the same mind attribution task, which I just showed you before, uh, and, and looking at the same picture of the cow. We then say, look, now, now you're going to complete, participate in a different study. This is on consumer behaviour now, and we're going to get you to eat some food and just simply rate your, you know, how tasty and enjoyable it was. For half of those participants sitting at the table, we told them we were going to eat delicatessen beef, and we put a plate of this on the table. For the other half of the participants, we told them they are going to sample a green apple, and we put a bowl of green apples on the table. So half the participants thought they were about to eat meat, 
green uh, beef, delicatessen beef, the other half, some green apples. The research assistant then went out of the room and said, I'm just getting some plates and cutlery so you can you know, sample your food. Um, while I do, could you just quickly fill out this one questionnaire again? And again, we got them to do the mine attribution task. What you can see here is that overall at time one, which is the grey bar there, people attributed a certain amount of mine to the cow. At time two, those who thought they were going to, now all these people are meat eaters, those who thought they were going to eat apples attributed the same amount of mine. But those who thought that they were going to eat meat changed their perception of a cow's mind in preparation for the fact that they knew that they are going to eat meat. And what's more, the extent to which they denied the mind to the cow made them feel better about the fact they were going to eat meat. It reduced their negative affect. So we sort of really showed, I guess, a psychological process here of how people do get around this paradox of caring about animals but also wanting to eat, eat them. What happens, though, when you know, we do eat meat, when we have eaten meat? Does this change our perception of the world around us? In this study, we asked people to uh, either eat some beef jerky or to eat some cashew nuts and to, again, rate the qualities of it simply as a consumer task. We then asked them to select from this list of 26 animals, circle the ones that they thought were deserving of moral concern, the ones that they felt were, you know, things we should be morally concerned about. Again, gorillas are probably going to be circled a lot, but maybe snails and rats a little less so. They could, they could, they could circle them all or they could circle none at all. Most people did something in between that. We then gave them the same, showed them the same picture of our cow here and we said, right now, how much moral concern do you feel for this cow? As you can see here, when people had eaten beef jerky, again, as a different part of the study, they didn't know these things were connected, they circled fewer animals that they thought were deserving of moral concern and they also indicated that the cow probably was less deserving of their moral concern as well, compared to people, again, meat eaters, but who had just eaten cashew nuts. So here you can see that actually consuming meat has changed people's perceptions in line with their behaviour to, again, make that behaviour appear and feel a little less problematic. Now, there's another way we can perhaps get around this as well. Is, is, it, is it enough, in fact, simply to say that an animal is food? Does simply framing an animal as food change our perception of that animal? So in this particular study, we presented people with information about the Bennett's tree kangaroo. Now, not many people have eaten the Bennett's tree kangaroo, so we wanted to get something which was, again, further away from people's diets. And we said that the Bennett's tree kangaroo was living in Papua New Guinea. This is the Bennett's tree kangaroo here, and, and, and there's, there's Papua New Guinea. Now, people were either told that the tree kangaroo is food for the locals, or it's not food. And they were told in the food condition that it was both hunted in some cases. In one condition, they were told it was hunted. In another condition, they were told it was simply collected. People didn't actually actively kill it. They just collected it when it died and ate it. So two kinds of ways we might use animals for food. In the other condition, they were just simply presented with the animal, or they were told that it had accidentally died. They then rated the tree kangaroo's ability to suffer if it was harmed. And as you can see here, whether they were presented with a live animal or a dead animal, they still saw that when it wasn't food, that it had a certain level of capacity to suffer. But when it was food, whether it was collected or hunted, it didn't matter. They changed their perception of its capacity to suffer. And again, this is just simply because we framed it as food. People don't eat Bennett's tree kangaroo very often. So the meat paradox is really made up of these different elements. And I guess it highlights that our perceptions of animals are, are both motivated and also quite flexible. We change our perceptions of animals to fit in with our behaviour and to help us to, I guess, overcome this psychological conflict, which is that we like to eat meat, but we also like to care for animals. And in this sense, our relationship with animals is fairly characterised as full of conflict and inconsistency, not only between choosing which animals we're going to eat, but also in how we think about the animals that we do eat. And the fact is that it seems we engage in a range of mental backflips that allow us to maintain our apparent ambivalence toward animals and our use of them for food. So why a psychology of meat eating? What's the importance of, of you know, even looking at these sorts of questions? Well, I think the first thing is it makes us think. It makes us think about what we do and what we have to do if we do eat meat. We have to sort of take on board those psychological backflips. And it highlights, in that sense, the moral cost, not only for animals, but also for us. There's a moral cost for animals, but there's also a moral cost for us. We have to 
shape our moral worlds and our moral perceptions in ways which allow us to engage in a behaviour which, if you scratch the sur surface of it, most people are kind of uncomfortable about it. And this is also critical because people are increasingly consuming meat. What was once a delicacy has become a staple food. So meat consumption is definitely on the rise. And now, rather than being something on the side of our plate, it's the main, it's the main, main course. And this increased consumption of meat is also associated with the corresponding increase in animal harm. The more that we eat meat, the more we need factory farms to be able to produce masses and masses of animals and, and meat, etc. We can't go and hunt animals anymore. This is not how we produce meat. We now raise them, grow them and kill them in factory environments. And of course, this really means that the more meat we eat, the more harm is perpetrated. And I'll also argue that really the meat paradox is getting stronger. So our in we are eating more meat. People are eating more and more meat. And yet, at the same time, we're actually more and more sensitive to the rights and needs of animals. The fact is, you guys would not be sitting here 100 years ago. This would not be a an event uh, you know, that many years ago. We weren't sensitive to animals' needs and rights in the same way that we are today. So this, this meat paradox is actually becoming stronger. It's starting to become a, a bigger conflict. And of course, this has a number of ramifications. In some ways, it means that you know, we have to actually further and further change our perceptions of animals if we're going to continue to eat meat. In other ways, it perhaps suggests that people are going to give up that behaviour because the, the conflict is becoming too great. So I'd like to just uh, say thank you. And also, I had some, some contributors there, but they weren't there. That's OK. So thank you very much.